Ah, uh, don't record yet. Okay, let's go. Hello, you're through the books, boys. You've got Dean on the line. Who's calling? Hello, my name's Claire Dunn. Hi, ah, how are you? Claire, I'm great, thanks. How are you? Fabulous, thanks. Uh, it's a great coincidence that you would ring in just as we were chatting about your book. So that's fantastic. I have two of your books with me, actually. I've read Wheel of Fortune, and I'm looking very much looking forward to Sun Ascendant um, on our next episode. So it's funny because normally I, I read a book and then I'll ask the author, like, oh, is there a sequel planned? But in this case, like, oh, I've got the sequel right here already. So I suppose the question is, how many are there going to be? <laughs> well, I plan about six. Wow. Things. Started off as a trilogy and then expanded. So I'm looking to about six, eight maximum. Eight ma okay, so wow, a minute, six to eight. And are we looking at a constant time flow or are we going to jump about a little bit prequels and and so forth nope this is uh going to be starting in 1469 it'll go through to about 1485 but to be precise i'm not going to uh, give that away at the okay moment. no that's that's fair but we're looking at a, a steady forward a steady... time flow yeah good yeah. chronology where so this is obviously as you say set in the 1400s um is history your your vibe is that what you studied oh it's hopeless so yes i think i grew up sort of loving history from the word go i can't remember a time when i didn't so my mother allowed me to watch the wars of the roses a series yes. which was on black and white back in the 1960s when i was a tiny tiny tot and that that got me interested but it wasn't until I was nine, and I, I, I was very late to reading. I didn't read until I was nine, and when oh, wow. I did, I read everything. <laughs> and I picked up my brother's really outdated history book and read it. And I got to the bit about uh, Richard III and, and the princes in the tower, and this mm. great rage, outrage, filled me, this nine-year-old, very precocious. And I thought something's really wrong here this is so skewed it feels so wrong yeah and from that moment on i was hooked on the wars of the roses that was it so i studied it at university nice. and, and although my career took a different path and i went into specialist education completely different mm. nonetheless i continued studying and researching the medieval late me medieval english period okay it's my thing Fantastic. My, my degree is in, in history as well, but it's in ancient Greek and Roman history. So I never really touched too much on this period. Um, although I, I take occasional evening classes on, you know, they'll they'll do some on the more popular things, Henry VIII and, and, and that kind oh. of stuff. But I never really covered too much of this period. So it's it's very interesting. What would you say is the blend of like how much how grounded is this in the history and how much of it is just like a fictional story that you wanted to tell? What's the split? All right. So the main character, Isabel Fenton, is fictional, sure. as um are the Earl and his brother Robert. But what I like to do is take fictional characters, give them lives of their own, but mm -hmm. very much rooted in reality, rooted yeah. in history. And then I blend that with um, the people, historical figures. So you have Edward IV um, and people like uh, Warwick, Montague, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Sure. Um, and they come, they play a major role, an increasingly important role as the books go on, as the series progresses. Okay. And I like to be able to weave the fictional with the historical because it gives me more freedom to uh, explore various topics and subjects and to look at some areas which are sometimes neglected um, mm -hmm. in history, look at perhaps the role of, in this particular case, a young woman from the sticks. She, yeah. she from North Lincolnshire. I mean, it's it was an important region, but uh, it's certainly nothing that you'd really hear about today. Mm -hmm. if you're talking about history, it's usually Henry VIII or his uh, kin. So um, I, I like to be able to bring in a historical authenticity mm -hmm. with fictional story. I think, yeah, I think that's the way to do it and, and, and try to blend it as well as you can. I want to ask you, so obviously we like Isabel. She's our main character and everything. She's originally supposed to marry uh, Thomas uh, Lacey. 
And I originally, I, I, my opinion on it has changed after finishing the book, you know, because my first opinion was kind of like, oh, this poor chap thought he was going to marry this girl and, and now he's not. And then as we go further on, I'm kind of like, I think she had a lucky escape from uh, from, from this guy, to be honest. Uh, are we meant to dislike Thomas? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let uh, readers decide that um i don't think isabel likes him very much and, no. and i'm probably on isabel's side on this one yeah because some of the things he'll say it's a little not not to give too much away but it's a little bit of kind of well once you're my wife you'll not have any opinions of your own kind of kind of thing and it's like oh okay yeah. uh, maybe maybe steer clear of this guy although for the time period um mm -hmm. i don't know if she would have done much better no, exactly. Um, he wasn't really any different from, from many. He, he was echoing the opinions of the period. Um, once she married him, she would become, to all intents and purposes, his echo. She would have no opinions publicly other than his own. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he was, in many ways, just a normal guy. In many ways. Yeah, not in others. And not in others. Mm -hmm. And her dad tries to explain that to her as well. And and there's a, yes. a funny bit where, you know, she likes to spend her time in the garden and he's kind of like, yeah, her husband might, might, might not be too keen on garlic and uh, things like that, you know? And she's like, <laughs> well, but I like it. So, <laughs> Well, she's she's a bit, she's rather naive, although she, she's been educated um, and she can speak and write and read Latin. And her father has indulged her with, with uh, learning history and all sorts of things like that. Nonetheless, she's quite naive and she has always been um, mistress in her own little kingdom mm. and to be suddenly thrust into the big wide world where she is nobody is quite a shock yeah i think she would if there was some way she could have just stayed in that little bubble she might have been uh, happy but maybe that wasn't possible in the in the long term you know and at some point her father was going to pass on and she was going to have to you know brave the world without him and there is a sad moment where someone explains to her the harsh reality, not even sad, just just true. You 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 can't, as a woman, you know, run your estates. You you need a man, basically, whether it's mm -hmm. a husband or a father. No one's gonna respect you as the kind of local landlord as a woman, and that's the harsh reality, I guess, that she has to face up to. Um, although although there were women, especially if they were widows who mm. uh, did end up running their own estates or their own businesses. So the, there were precedents, but on the whole, you as a woman, you were a daughter, a wife, a widow. You weren't yeah. necessarily yourself. So the trick would have been to marry Thomas and then put a bit of arsenic in the, in the coffee, I think, and <laughs> get, get widowed quickly. <laughs> It would have been one way. I'm not sure if that's in Isabel's character. No, know. it's it's not. I don't think it. I don't think it is. <laughs> at least from from the first book. At least anyway. Um, and I like her. I like her independence. And I guess there is a bit of naivete there. But I, I she's trying to present as a as a strong, you know, lead character. And unfortunately, she's a bit not in the right time period for that. I think. Um. Some of the things that happened to her are, are are fairly horrific. I mean, was that difficult for you to write about some of the things that transpire with the Earl? I think all it was doing is reflecting um, two things. First of all, uh, her position as a woman um, who had very little, yeah. uh, had no place really within that particular household. Um, but also... It isn't quite as black and white as it seems, so that although what happened was indeed horrific, we're not we're not looking at a very simple scenario because it reflects as much the problems with the Earl as it does with Isabel's situation. I'm being really careful not to give anything yeah. away. <laughs> um so I'm hedging I'm hedging things a bit. But uh, I, I don't like just presenting things in black and white. I like them to be a bit more nuanced. So yeah. there is a lot more history behind the Earl's actions than a, at first might appear. It doesn't in any way ameliorate his actions. It doesn't mm. excuse them at all. Uh, but it perhaps makes them more understandable in time. Whether or not Isabel accepts that whether or not she understands it is something that only by reading you can actually you will discover mm. 
And I think it would be, it's one thing in her position, potentially to come to understand the causes or motivations. But at the same time, yeah, as you say, you you, you can't take away that, that she's been through a horrific ordeal. I wouldn't necessarily yeah. expect her to, she might understand it, but I wouldn't expect her to forgive necessarily. And no. That. We'll, no. I guess we'll, we'll see in the next book. <laughs> Yep. Yes. Yes. I really don't. Want, I. I don't say much more. All I can say is that it was nonetheless still considered to be. Um, wasn't considered to be something that was an acceptable mm. behavior on the Earl's part. It would have been condemned in certain quarters. Sure. Nothing might have happened beyond that, especially since Isabel by that time didn't have a male relative to appeal. Um, appeal to. Um, to prosecute any particular um, yeah. legal aspect, but nonetheless, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't something. It wasn't a oh, oh boys will be boys. That it wouldn't have necessarily been looked at mm. that way. I do remember when uh, is it Robert the Earl's uh, brother mm -hmm. discusses it with him, and the Earl kind of says, "Well, you know, she doesn't have a, a any male relative for me to kind of have offended or to apologize to." And Robert's kind of like, well, oh. what about her? Like, you know, you've offended <laughs> yeah. her. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he sort of missed the point. Completely, so. yeah. So I like I like Robert, but I, well, again, we'll obviously we'll we'll see what happens next, um, because we only see really a, a brief snippet. I at this point was disappointed that he didn't stand up to his brother more, but maybe we'll maybe we'll see if he does going forward. Mm. Perhaps yeah. he does in the sequel, yeah. <laughs> because he, he seemed like a, you know, of course he's kind of a, a better person, morally speaking, as far as we can tell, and seems to to get along um, well with Isabel, and then is horrified when he finds out what's happening. I thought he was going to be like, right, okay, fisticuffs right now, but he doesn't. He mm -hmm. kind of has to know his own place a little bit. and uh, Yes. Yeah. You know. The younger brother... He is a younger brother. He has not been in awe, but he has always been um, subject to his brother's will, and they've always got on very, very well. They have a close relationship, especially since there is a history of trauma in, within the family. So yeah. they have cleaved. So this is really difficult for Rob. He is mm. he's a decent bloke. Yeah, he is. But he doesn't want to interfere he doesn't see it as his place to interfere. He's conflicted. Yeah, I suppose he naturally would be in the in the circumstances. Um, I also quite like not necessarily a, a sort of a main character, but I like uh, Buena, the the original servant of the mayor, I suppose, of Isabel. And we don't really see too much of her as the book goes on. They she tries to keep her with her, and is of course not allowed to bring her with her to to the earls, but. Uh, the mute character, but I, I like her. She tries to give a warning, and then I don't really know what her history is there. And I, I hope that we'll oh. we'll find out a little bit more about her. But she's intriguing. I think she's the character that I'm most intrigued about at the moment because I don't know anything Good. about her really. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Buena has uh, served her Isabel's mother, and um, is is very much um, a companion as well as servant to to Isabel. And being parted from Isabel is something that Buena will take to heart, and something she she will find very very difficult indeed. Mm. And I particularly like, of course, the, the the turn the pivot of the whole thing is that the historical setting, and there is a nice line where they someone references the king. You know, we'll have to do it there the way the king would want, or something like that. And they say, "Well, which king?" Yeah, and they say, "Well, our one." And I'm like, "Okay, are, are these two on the same page here or you know, do, they, do they know which uh, king they're supporting and that's that's funny because of course that's that's what was happening with the war of the roses and, and we find that in you know shakespeare and, and everything a very interesting time period so is that you that we, we talked a little bit about it at the beginning and that was your particular study uh period have you gone beyond that in your interests or do you just stick with like this is my this is my thing that this kind oh, of oh yes period? no i like the early modern period as well, both in England and in Europe. That's mm. particular interest. Zulu Wars, 19th century. Mm. Fascinating. Um, Stuart period, very interesting period, indeed. Course, yeah. uh, social history in the 19th century. Great. Yeah, very much so. Wars of the Roses is is where I tend to zoom back to, given sure. half a chance. But the other areas, yes, are also very interesting indeed. 
I'm okay with it. I get lost at a certain point. I think once we get to 20th century into your more modern history and the wars, I, I lose interest then. You know, I just, yes. <laughs> this is not my thing. I'm afraid. <laughs> so do I. Yes. <laughs> Uh, although that might just be a result of um, really doing them to death in uh, secondary school, you know. <laughs> I, it just never, never floated this particular boat here. No. So I like Isabel's career path here. She starts as a, as you say, she's running her own kind of little estate with her father. She's a little mini queen kind of kind of figure. And then she finds herself, oh, I'm I'm completely a nobody. And she's made to be a servant. And she sort of says, well, I'm not here to serve. I come from like a noble family and my mother was a noble. And they're like, well, well, we don't care. <laughs> so you're going to look after the kids. Um, but I like her fortitude and she takes to that job and she does well in it. And, and, and you know, it all goes well for her, at least within the job. Um, because the woman looking after the kids is quite cruel to them. Uh, Lady LaRoche, is it? And she's uh, pinching yeah. the, the girls and everything. Uh, it's very cruel, but I really like that uh, Isabel is not afraid. She doesn't go too far out to get herself, you know, imprisoned or anything, but she's not afraid to kind of stand up here and there and, and to try to put in a good word and to try to turn things around. And I think she's very good with the kids and, and a good influence on the family. So it's really nice to, to see that as well. She she likes children. She didn't know that she liked children, but she, I think she's only 16 when... Mm. She goes to uh, to the household of the Earl. She's very young in herself, and she can remember what it was like being obstinate, like uh, like Cecily is. So for her, it's only a question of common humanity, being able to see it from an, the child's point of view. Um, she she's quite an empathetic character. She's she has a kind heart, which is what Robert sees right at the very beginning. Yeah. She is kind. Um, but she, she doesn't always, she's not always had the opportunity to demonstrate that. This is the first time it's been tested yeah. properly. She has some good takes as well. Uh, one of my favourite lines in the whole book is actually when she's talking to her father and they're just going to talk about history and politics, the world in general. And she sort of says, you know, if only men wouldn't you know, be so greedy, you know, none of this would happen. And the father's kind of, is that what you think this is? And he then justifies the feudal system. And I'm like, I'm with her, to be honest. You know? <laughs> You've bought into the system a little bit too much and a system which has left him injured and, and everything like that, you know, but he's done kind of well in it I, I suppose but you know to the point where he's able to put in a favor with the earl to look after his daughter but i mean he's very much a product of the, of the system and she's kind of like no this doesn't seem great <laughs> you know hmm. however she is 16 and he is a much older man who's seen the world and he knows how things work she doesn't so right at the beginning she, she understands that her allegiance should be the same as, as her father's. At the same time, she questions that because she hasn't formed an opinion. Mm. Not that she'll be expected to, but being Isabel and being quite uh, forward for her gender of the period, then she, she wants to think about these things. She's been taught by her father to think and to question. So she's questioning. Um, so her, she sees things in quite a simplistic way. He doesn't because he's been around for a lot yeah, longer. He understands yeah. people. And she, of course, not only is able to think, but is, is educated to the point where she knows Latin and even tries to pass that on to, to Meg, the older of the of the daughters, uh, just despite being told specifically not to. But she's like, well, she wants to learn. So like, what's the problem? I, I love her attitude, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to spoil any more sort of plot points, so I think we'll we'll leave it there, and then I'll I'll talk briefly about the the next book next month, and oh. and uh, I'll keep my eyes out for the future installments. Um, but I'll ask you two final questions. The first is, would you like to just plug your website or tell people where they can get the book or something like that? Oh my word! What a lovely opportunity. Thank you. So my website is cfdun.co.uk, and uh, my books are currently available on Amazon. And they will be through uh, any of the um, Ingram Spark um, outlets as well. So they're available on Kindle and in paperback. Fantastic. Now, Quick yeah. bonus question, actually. You've got a nice shelf of books behind you there. Are you a big reader yourself? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, this is this is a smaller part of it. Oh, so, wow. um, yes. Yeah. Uh, I read a lot. 
a great deal. So th th this is just the very specific area that, and it goes on beyond wow. where you can see, which is all um, medieval period. Nice. And then uh, there are other sections which are anything from antiquity or all the way through to the Victorian period. That's amazing. But this is my main. My main. I have a couple story. hundred myself, but uh, it looks like you maybe have more of it's going to expand that far. That's fantastic. Last question, then, we'd like to ask everyone uh, who calls in, if there's any book, any existing book that you wish you'd been the person to write, what would it be? Oh, that's a terrible question. <laughs> one, one book. Oh. No, do you know, that, that's going to floor me. It would... Okay. I, I, I would slightly reframe the question and say, okay. if, we're, if we're looking at categories... Then, from a historical point of view, I would love to have written, I think, the book that really sparked my interest, We Speak No Treason. There you go, by Rosemary Hawley Jarman. That that would be the one, that and Josephine Tay for, for the Wars of the Roses. General interest, the gothic vibe would be Jane Eyre. Uh, I'd love okay. to have written Jane Eyre. What a masterpiece. Of course, yeah. 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 No, I think so, I think we can accept multiple answers because those are very you. different, uh, very different books. So <laughs> the answers on that range from my my childhood favorite book to what I'm reading at the moment to which book would have made me a millionaire. You know, it just it depends. But <laughs> fantastic. Right. Oh well, if we start on the children's books, then uh, the list is endless. <laughs> well, thank you so much for calling in. It's been lovely chatting to you, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. It's been Thank lovely you. meeting you this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Bye-bye.